Well, here we are again. Blessings in Jesus and welcome to uh, ARC Fellowship Sharing. Not in lockdown so much anymore, but for the time being, we are uh, going to continue at least for another two weeks. We're going to continue to share this way. So tonight, uh, I have to confess, I really dislike this topic and I've been trying to avoid it. Uh, I didn't realize I was trying to avoid it, but the more I had to write about it, the more I realized that I really don't want to share on this topic. But God really poked me and basically told me to get into my office and start writing and where to start writing from. So uh, far be it for me to argue with the boss. So here we go. Our topic is gender and the age we live in the world we live in gender issues are increasingly divisive there's a lot of hostility a lot of cruel words a lot of cruel behavior and for christians it's an especially hard time because so much of what really is foundational in the gospel and in, in scripture is under direct attack people calling you everything from crazy to evil because you won't go along with what society is rapidly moving to and it's a view about gender so i thought about how do we deal with this and as usual with god's help the answer is not so complicated. It's the usual answer, in fact. We need to go to the foundations. And I believe that if we can understand the foundation of this whole topic of gender, um, I assume everyone knows what we mean by gender, but let's just make sure we understand. So by gender, we mean biological definition of whether you are male or female not not what you perceive yourself to be in your head we're talking about your chromosomes your dna what kind of machinery you are okay so this is nothing about you were born a boy but you feel like a girl none of those things okay that's not gender that's that's self-identity that's a mental state nothing at all to do with how god made you if we understand the foundation then everywhere where we come across gender in the scripture if you apply your understanding that you're going to have by the end of this your understanding of how God established gender, then you will, I believe, have a fairly easy time of understanding what that scripture you're reading means. Because the foundations never shift, remember. So whether it's Old Testament or New, if you're reading something to do with men versus women or this rule for men or that rule for women and all those types of places where gender arises in the scripture, and not least the instructions of the apostles, then making sure your understanding rests comfortably on the foundations we're going to look at in a minute will help you come to a, a confidence and a peace that you've got the right understanding that God wants you to have from whatever scripture it is you're reading. So with that in mind, you'll be relieved to know we're not going to troll from Genesis to Revelation looking for every reference to gender because we would be here for months and years and decades probably doing that. We're going to look straight to Genesis, straight to the foundation and then the rest hopefully will become clear to you by application of what you learn. Next time we're going to do a part two uh, 
hopefully not a terribly long one, but just the other side of the coin we need to look at, which is what is what happens, what does the scripture say about when God's foundational rules about gender are broken? So we'll do that next time. But for now, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together, even if it is, Lord, by Facebook or YouTube or however someone sees us. We ask you, Lord, to nevertheless be present by your Spirit and instruct us and teach us because you said that a man will not teach his neighbour, that you yourself would be our teacher. So we pray, Lord, that your Spirit would rest on each one who hears and also on me, Lord, so that we would be of one mind with you and one understanding. Because those that perish, perish because they don't love the truth and we don't want to be people who don't love the truth. We ask you for the truth, all of the truth, the truth according to your word. Your word is the truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Okay, so if you have a handout, now incidentally if you have the handout you'll see it's really long. So um, that is because it's such a, I guess in some ways a tricky topic. I made a lot of notes so that if you are reading this handout later or that's also posted on Facebook, there's a lots there that you can just go slowly through until you really get it. But hopefully we'll be much briefer than the nine pages. Oh uh, well, the nine pages of notes. So turn with me and in your handout on page one, or if you're opening your Bible, we're in Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two and beginning in verse four. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now you're all very familiar with that, I'm sure. And in English, it reads okay. The understanding you get reading it in English is all right. But on our topic of gender, unfortunately the English translation, and therefore I'm assuming for my Filipino friends, I'm assuming the Tagalog uh, version may well be the same. You miss things that are there in the original Hebrew regarding gender that you don't see or can't see in English. Because English, as I'm always reminding you, is a fairly weak language for describing things. So to look at why God wants us to come here to Genesis to, to discover about gender, we need to go back to its original language, to Hebrew. Now you don't have to learn these Hebrew words, so and you don't need to end up a Hebrew speaker, you just need to get the concepts, okay? So don't be intimidated. It won't matter if you don't remember the Hebrew words, just remember the principles that they reveal, and that will be enough. So it says there in verse 7 that God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In the Hebrew, he formed, formed. Remember, we're talking about dust. Now, if you go outside when it's dry, because I have, the Hebrew word for dust is afar, here in the scripture, afar, and it means specifically bone dry dust. So not mud, not clay, nothing like that, dust. Now, even if you're a very skilled potter or a very skilled with your hands, go and see if you can make anything out of a pile of dust other than a pile of dust doesn't stick together, it doesn't keep a shape, as soon as you let go, whatever 
shape you put it in, it'll promptly fall to pieces. To form something means to conform it to a specific pattern. So it's very important to understand that's what the Hebrew means. God took something that's essentially formless, dust just lies there or blows around in the wind. And he caused it to take a specific shape. He formed it. This will get clear as we go along. So just try, as I say, just try and stay with the concepts even if we don't remember the words, okay? And it says, he formed a man from the dust of the ground. In Hebrew, he formed Adam. You English speakers will call him Adam. And I know a few Adams, but it's actually Adam. He formed Adam from afar, dry dust, of the earth. Adama. Adam, Adam, gets his name from what he's made of, dirt. In Hebrew for the earth, soil, dirt, is Adama. Adam, Adam, comes from Adama. Nothing complicated there, but it's important to understand he takes up dry dust, formless, lifeless dust, and then it says he breathed into the nostrils of what he had made and filled it with the breath of life. So in English, you get the idea that God is given, uh, he's taken his pile of dust and somehow he's got it to stay in a certain shape, he's formed it, and then he he sort of does like a CPR thing, you know, what is it, the breath of life, you know, if you've done first aid, and he, he puts his breath into it, and it comes back to life. So if you've done life saving or, or your first aid course or whatever, you're familiar with that idea, right? And that's all true. That's basically what it means. The English, what you get from the English is not wrong. But it misses something that you can only get when you understand it in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says he filled this new thing he's made with his neshama, neshama, which gets translated as breath of life. But neshama has a particular meaning to Hebrews, this word, because the Hebrew understanding of how you are composed is where you have one eternal, indestructible part and two destructible parts, temporary parts. So you have your physical body, you know, if you pinch your leg, they're pinching the temporary part of you. Your body will not last. It, no matter who you are, your body, from the moment you're born, it's dying. You know, from the minute you were born, the clock is running down to where that body will be worn out. It's temporary. Your mind is the same. You know, it, our mind lives in the minute for the most part and has a has a, a memory which isn't perfect. You know, it's very selective and we don't remember everything that happened. We just remember bits and pieces which our brains can use to recall certain things to make decisions and so on. When you die, your body and your mind end. But that other part, your soul, uh, you can substitute the word spirit with a small s, okay? So whether you call it your soul or your spirit, it is eternal. That's the part that is either going to God, to the kingdom, at the judgment, or going into the lake of fire. That's that eternal part. So whether you're going to heaven or hell, it's for eternity because your soul 
cannot be destroyed, only relocated. Very important to understand that. The rest of it, though, your body and your mind are just temporary. And if you're wondering, if you're wondering what happens later, then at the resurrection, we're told that we get a new body, an eternal one, a perfect one that doesn't ever get old or get sick. It's a t so at last all of all of you becomes eternal. That's a, a something for another day. But the Hebrew understanding of how your soul comes to be is very, very important to our story. And that's why we reading it in Hebrew it tells us about something to do with gender that you wouldn't get in English. And it goes like this. We just read that God breathed Neshema into this pile of dust and caused Adam, man, to become a living thing instead of a pile of inert dust. You can you can basically describe the difference between something that's alive and something that's not alive by whether it still has breath. You know, in the old days, you used to take a mirror and hold it to a person's mouth and nostrils, and if it fogged the mirror, the person was still alive, even if they looked dead. But if there's no fog of the mirror, you said, oh, well, they've died, there's no breath left in them. That's the idea of this. In the Hebrew understanding, Neshema is unique to God. Neshema is like God's soul, his essence, his essential being, his, the equivalent of that eternal part of you. The Neshema is that for God himself. his unchanging, eternal self, if you like. So it begins, because it's unique to God, that's its origin. So that's pictured by it's in God, and he breathes it out of himself into the dust. When you breathe out, you create wind, don't you? you blow, it's like blowing, you suck in and you blow out, right? So, that breath in God is called Neshema. When it comes out like a wind, so it's left him and it's traveling. It has energy. It has energy to do work because it's going to create. Okay, so the, the dust doesn't create itself. The 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 breath going out causes the dust to come to life, right? So it's doing work, creating. Wind, the word for wind is ruach. And as most of you know by now, the word ruach is interchangeable for both wind and spirit. So this is a picture of God's spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, going out from him. Ruach. But when it goes into the dust, they give it a, a different name, a third name. Nefesh. Nefesh is the Hebrew word for rest, as in taking a rest. You know, coming to a halt, resting. It's three ways of describing one thing. The Neshima that which begins in God, it's God's. When it travels out, Ruach, when it's in the dust, Nefesh. Okay?
when we talk about the ruach being the active because it's like moving air like wind okay that oh, uh, uh, that where it says in Matthew 10 God can destroy both body and soul in hell the the words there how can I describe it so I'm not trying not to get sidetracked but that's important it's just pointing to Matthew 10 28 God can destroy both body and soul in hell the hellfire it says that the, that the smoke of their torment goes up aeon aeon is, which means forever and forever. So that tells you that what happens in the lake of fire doesn't stop. It's eternal. So what Jesus, what Jesus is meaning by he can destroy both body and soul, he means that not... He, he, he doesn't... Because remember, the context is he's saying, don't be afraid of those who can only kill the body but can't do anything about your eternal soul. So the context is, when he's saying destroy, he can he means remove any future, remove any hope, like a waking death in the lake of fire. The, the, the terrifying thing is that your soul is eternal. The destruction of your soul that, Matt, that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 10 is that if it ends up in the lake of fire it's like being as if it's been burned up every day but it doesn't burn up so if only it would just burn up and then it would be over but there's no end okay so it's like an ongoing continuous destruction that never has an end Does that make sense we know that from the rest of the how it's described in Revelation that as I say the smoke of the torment goes up a yon on us forever and forever or well, ages upon ages is its actual translation so good question back to what I was saying we know that God quite often will say one thing in two different ways to emphasize so remember how it mentioned that he had not sent the rain Rain in the scripture, as you know, like the former rains and the latter rains, former, uh, the rain in the scripture is nearly always used by God as a picture of the Holy Spirit poured out. You know, so when he says that he hadn't caused it to rain and there's no life, it's just a big planet, of a big dusty ball. When he's talking about there being no rain and when he takes dust of the earth and the Hebrew word is specific that it's dry dust. Remember how we say you can go and try it for yourself. You can take up a couple of handfuls of dry dust and try packing them together or something and see if you can make it stay in shape. It doesn't stay in shape. How do you make it stay in shape? You add water. You make it like clay and then you can form it into something the ruach the breath going out that's his spirit that's what rain that's always pictured by rain coming doesn't say it specifically but it's implied the other thing that tells us a little bit about this is the word that's used the hebrew word that's used for formed when he formed man where that word gets used in the rest of scripture especially in the old testament is uh, almost always associated with pottery you know where you take clay and you make a vessel you form it you take up clay and you form it into something useful so the association of that word with clay and forming a pot forming a vessel to contain something is all throughout the scripture so it doesn't say it specifically, but I think there's enough there for us to to take that as an, like an echo, like a second line of the same argument, if you like. But that's what God's doing. Why is this of importance to us? Well, let's flip over to page two, and it will get clearer and clearer, I hope, in the moment.
when they use when the word used speaks of God taking that which is his essential self and putting it in this pile of dust. That is a great significance for it's like making a, an echo of himself. You know, uh, I'm sure you all have heard something along, people say something along the lines, there's many versions, but they'll say something along the lines of God made man in his image. We are made in his image, something like that. I'm sure you've all heard people saying things like that. It comes from these chapters of Genesis, right? But because God has, because that word is neshama, and that is speaks uniquely of God's soul, if you like. In the Hebrew, this is really clear that he, God is making something that is the image of himself. He's not making another God, but he's stamping, he's impressing himself upon this dust, forming this clay, if you like, and then he, when he brings it to life, the life in it is directly from him. He puts his, himself as a, like a like a mold or a stamp on it and this is really critical as we go along you'll you'll discover that this initial step being a hundred percent copy if you like reflection of God is critical to our understanding so the first thing to understand from what we just listened to it's when God had gone up to that point. So when Adam was standing there alive, a living thing, the first living thing, the breath in him is Neshama, copied from God. He is like God in... Uh, in re he re yeah, he's like the reflection of God. I'm just being cautious that you don't misunderstand me and think he didn't make a, a direct copy of himself as if making another God. He made man. But everything in Adam is copied from God. Very important to understand that, 100%. Now, One of the things that happened at the fall, you know, sin entered in, we're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, you know how Genesis goes on. What happens is that perfect image, you know, when he's created, Adam is a perfect reflection of his creator, made in his literal image. The fall messes that up. So we are no longer like him, we no longer reflect him, and it gets worse. Eventually, we can't remember what he's like as a creation. So when you're born, before you're saved, you don't know Jesus, you don't know God, you haven't any inkling at all, really what is really like. It's only when you're born again. And how does that happen? Because that creation process is repeated. He sends the Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Ruach, Wind, Kodesh, Holy. Ruach HaKodesh, that's the proper name of the Holy Spirit, goes out from God again and impresses upon you now a new creation and keeps pressing on you to re 
to recover the image of God, this time specifically Jesus, his son, in you. So that your innermost being in particular is conformed again to him, specifically to Jesus, his son. So you're, when you're born again, you are a new creation because the creation process is repeated the same way. His breath goes out from him into you, just as it did with Adam. Progressively, that I say progressively because we all know that that process, sanctification, doesn't happen with a flash of light and it's all done. It's progressive, right? But as God is recreating us as his disciples, that is what is happening. But Adam, the first one, the first one of us, when he's first created, he's perfect. He is the perfect reflection of his creator. Keep that in mind. One interesting side effect of this, though, is it's to one of the hardest things to find in the world is a genuine atheist. A genuine atheist has to sincerely believe that there is no God of any kind at all. You know, atheist means literally that there is no God of any kind. That's what the word means, it's Greek. But since everybody's spirit originally came from God, you know, the spirit at rest in you, that which stops you from being just a pile of dust and makes you a living being, every human spirit had its origin with God. So even though we don't remember what he looks like, and before you're born again, you don't really know him, it's funny how, especially under pressure, you know, they say there's no atheists in, in the trenches, you know, when the bullets start flying. At some level, to some degree, even the most die-hard atheist somehow knows that there is God. Because somehow our, our own soul has a distant memory of where it came from, of its creator. It knows, it's, it, knows it was created and it knows that something held it in its hands and put it here in this body can't remember who or what or where that you don't come to know that unless you're born again of course but it's interesting because I've, I've met a few people who claim to be atheists but it doesn't take long questioning them before they realize that they're not really atheists what they are is people who don't who you might call them agnostics they they don't know that god is for sure but they can't completely dismiss him as i say because some part of them remembers being with god in the beginning So the, all you need to really take away from that first bit is when it's just Adam by himself, he's the only creation, the only human so far in this story, he is the 100% reflection of God. Remember, there's no female. So the first thing is when it comes to gender, up to now in the story, there are no genders. There are no females. There's only male. Male, single. Just a dumb. And it actually continues for a reasonable while. We're going to go and have a look. Now we remember we were in Genesis 2. We're going to just pop back to Genesis 1 now to see where does God introduce gender. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that gender is introduced in the person of Eve, the first woman, the first female. But as we'll read again shortly in Genesis, there is a considerable period of time where there is no female it's just God and Adam and animals, more and more and more and more animals. Okay, animals, trees and plants. Eve comes quite late in the picture, in the story. So for quite a long time, the only 
gender. Hi, Ben. Good to see you. Um, the only gender is male. Okay, in fact, gender wouldn't even have any meaning to Adam. He's just the man, singular. But we go back now and we're going to look at Genesis 1, verse 26, where gender first comes into the gospel. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea over the birds of the sky over the cattle over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them now, if you read that quicker in English, you'll, you, you'll miss what just happened there. In these two verses, what has God just said? He says, let's make another creation. We'll call it man. Adam is the Hebrew word that's there. And remember, it just means... Uh, a bit of dirt. Adam comes from Adama, earth. So we're going to make man and we're going to make him to be in our image according to our likeness. And he says he created man in his own image. He created him. And then in the same sentence, so that's all singular, right? He created man, singular, created him, singular. And then in the same sentence, it suddenly switches and says, male and female, he created them, plural. You think, is this just bad grammar or what? But remember, God is very precise in his words. Words mean everything in the scripture. Words, especially in the original language, say a lot so it might seem contradictory that god says i'm going to make a man and then he finishes the sentence by saying male and female them plural it turns out by studying these what it says here you actually start to unfold the whole the whole uh foundation of gender and its purpose so let's look more closely in the first bit so if you've got your bible there we're still in verse 26 genesis 1 26 let us make man in our image in our image the hebrew word there for image is tzalem in our tzalem Salam is really specific. It means like a mirror image, a copy, a reflection. So if you've seen the image, you know what the real thing looks like, you know? It's what Jesus means when he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Like that. So he says, let's make Adam salam exactly the image of me but then suddenly and incidentally salam is a noun and it's masculine so all every all the reference to so far is all masculine 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 a adam is a boy not that there's any girls yet but even the word used salam is masculine but then suddenly in that sentence where it says, according to our likeness, that word is likeness, is demuth. Demuth is not an exact copy. It means to resemble. You know, someone says to you, oh, you know, imagine they probably say to me, oh, you look a bit like Brad Pitt. <laughs> no. But 
to, you resemble. They're not saying you look exactly like, or you are exactly like, but there's bits and pieces and maybe how you walk or how you smile or something that, remo you know, there's like enough that people say, oh, you know, you resemble that other person. That's the meaning of demos. So it sounds like God's contradicting himself because he says, I'm going to make this exact copy. And the, that word is masculine. And then in the same sentence, he repeats himself, but now he says, I'm going to make him just resemble me, not an exact copy. And here's the smart bit. Demoth is also a noun, but it's feminine. This is not an accident. What comes first in the sentence is the perfect reflection and it's masculine. As the sentence continues, it switches to not perfectly reflecting anymore, now only resembling, and it's feminine. And as we look at the process, you will discover what that means and it's a good thing so especially if you're a girl listening to this don't worry it's not knocking you it's a good thing and you'll see how in a minute but remember God's careful with his words and this is not an accident that it's written this way then if you go down to verse 27 God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. That word him, in the original Hebrew, is the word zakar. Zakar is the Hebrew word for a male. So once again, just like in verse 26, the sentence starts with, I'm going to make him, and it's a specifically male word. And then straight away, the sentence changes to male and female. He created them. Verse 26 and verse 27 have, are like echoes. You know, that's a very Hebrew thing. When God repeats himself using different words, we're supposed to pay attention. As I say, it's like, you know, texting in capitals or typing in bold. You, it's meant to draw your attention when God does that. So the pattern of it is important. It begins with just male and, it end, and perfect copy ends with a feminine word and now only resembling. Verse 27 is the same. It starts with we're going to make him and the word is the Hebrew word for male then straight away switches to talking about male and female. Get the idea? At the beginning, male. At the end, male and female. At the beginning, perfect copy. At the end, just resembling. And if you haven't, if you're thinking, what's he talking about? Don't worry, it'll all come clear in a second. Just see that though in the scripture, that God has repeated that side by side. Well, it looks as if it, almost as if it's nonsense, or at the very least bad grammar. It's deliberate by God. So I think, because what he's really saying is, oh, oh, spoiler alert, okay. What he's really saying is, I'm going to start with something that's a perfect copy of me, and it's completely male, Adam. But I'm not going to end there. Just like my sentence changes the end is different from the beginning. The beginning of the sentence, it's all male. It's all about a perfect copy. By the end of the sentence, it's gone feminine. And we have a male and a female. Because what happens in the process follows that pattern. The pattern in the sentences, the pattern in the two verses, is the pattern of what God does. So if you are on the handout, we're going to move to page three now. It 
it's probably worth just pausing for a second to consider because my, we, if anyone's heard anything like this before be very surprised so there is so much confusion in the church over gender between you know the feminist movement having come in and confused everybody the political correctness coming in and confusing everybody and more lately the whole lgbt thing coming in and super confusing everybody i know so many people in churches as soon as you mention gender they want to run away and hide and when you say what does the bible say they'll look at you blankly because they sort of thought they knew what it said but now they're not so sure because all of this is so confused them so if this seems like you know up to now like a bit of a weird topic please persevere because if you can get this understanding this foundational understanding you'll be able to a get your head around everything else god says as i said if you can get the foundation straight and you'll be able to help people in the church in particular out so they can find where the solid ground is you you will not stop the world going the way it's going they will still question they will still challenge they will still talk a whole lot of hogwash complete nonsense but we are to come out and be separate from them and to stand in the truth okay so just thought i'd throw that in there just to remind us that you know this isn't just a a word game an academic exercise this is about being able to stand in the last days back to genesis 2 genesis 2 verse 18 then the lord god said it is not good for a man to be alone i will make a suitable helper for him out of the ground so let's just pause there god said it's not good for man to be alone because remember at this point there is no woman there aren't even any other men it's just adam adam he is on his own apart from god adam doesn't complain it's god who says it's not good for him to be alone i need to make him a helpmate a helpmate so it's very important for us all to understand god's purpose in creating females and if you went to a university like me and i used to be a feminist <laughs> oh dear anyway you know when you're young and at uni you do dumb things but it's very important to not to jump to the, to the conclusion that what I'm going to say next is that, you know, women are there just to help men. It's not what God just said. What God just said is, man on his own is a bit useless. Do you get that? If you're a guy, talking to us guys now, that's what God, that's what how God sees you and me. On our own, you know, big tough guys, <laughs> but we're not very good on our own we don't do well it is not good for men to be alone you know we talk about women being the weaker sex well god starts out saying hmm boys you're not strong enough you know i need someone to help you because you're not strong enough so ladies please understand even though the especially in the english translation it sounds a bit condescending that oh so god made you just to be a helpmate for the boys particularly in the original hebrew it's much clearer the issue at heart here is the inadequacy of men on their own so i hope you'll feel a bit empowered by that you ought to you are God's solution to man, men's inadequacy. So never think of yourself as the lesser partner. You have a, you just have a different and specific role. Okay? And never let any guy, especially a church guy, talk down to you as if, oh, well, you're just the helpmate. You're just the, you know, you're just the sidekick. I'm Batman and you're just Robin. No. 
That's not what God said. He said that on, you know, on their own, men will barely make it, often don't make it. And you only have to look around to see that that's true. Even in the church, sometimes especially in the church. Okay, so if you're a woman, you are God's solution to our problem. You know, not the hired help. Make sure you understand that. Anyway, let's go back. What does God do first? Does he make Eve straight away? No, he doesn't. And it's important to understand that. Nine, verse 19. Out of the ground, out of the Adama, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see that, to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that's what it was called. God named everything. Man gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So look what happened. And important we get this. Where did all those other living things come from? The same way that Adam was formed, God formed them. He took Adama, the earth, dust, and he put life in it. So just as he formed something in the image of himself and he called that Adam, man, he took more dust and he put life in it and he called it a cow. And he, this one he was a camel and this is an elephant and this is a bird and this is a snake and this is a fish. And so on and so on and so on. So he... He doesn't make Eve straight away. And what I said that for quite a long time, there is no gender issue because there's only one gender. God's looking for a helpmate, someone who can aid Adam in his task, which is to, originally, he was supposed to be like the caretaker of the creation. You read that in there, that God will give him a kind of dominion to, to rule on behalf of God or, you know, um, like a caretaker. So in that task, he should have some help. Everything God created turned out to be not suitable, be suitable for something else for what he created it for, but it wasn't suitable as this helpmate that man needed. You know, so if you're looking at your wife now, be grateful, because God was first looked at, you know, giraffes, fish, and gorillas <laughs> before he gave up and he made woman. The important factor, though, is all of those things he made from the earth, the same as Adam was made from the earth. What does that mean for our story? Well, it's important to understand that he made each thing unique. You know, he just didn't swap parts. He made fresh from the raw material a new creation called a cow. He made a, an, another fresh creation called a donkey. And so on and so on. They're all new creations straight from the earth. In the same way he has made Adam. They have no connection to Adam. Nothing in common. Right? Nothing in common. So God gives up on that. He's made all these things and none of it was any good as a helpmate. Look what he does in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. The Lord God fashioned it into a woman, the, the rib. He takes the rib and he, he creates the woman from the rib, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then it finishes there in verse 24 and verse 25. I'll just read them now, but we'll come back to them later. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. and They shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Come back to those things later. But the key is that Eve is unique in the story so far. Every other living thing, God has taken up more of the earth put breath in it, life, and it is a new creation, a new thing. Nothing in common with Adam, it's a new thing all on its own. So every other living thing, so now the, the world has got lots of living things in it, it's only one human being, Adam. What did God not do? He didn't take up more of the earth he didn't put his breath in it and make another Adam he didn't make a second man this is critically important to understand God could have just helped Adam by making more Adams couldn't he you know to help with managing the creation but there's something we have to understand about the fact that God took what is his own essence his own core nature if you like and stamped it to, to make Adam remember at the moment Adam is a hundred percent reflection of God when he says it's not good for man to be alone how does he know that have you thought about that how does he know it's not good for man to be alone well the answer is remarkably simple he knows because he's made Adam in his image what you just read about, there's all these other created things, but none of them are satisfactory as a partner, you know, as a helper, as a helpmate. It's actually a repeat of God's story. He knows all about this intimately because, remember, Adam is in his first creation. He made all the heavenly beings, including thousands upon thousands of angels including Satan you know heaven's a busy place God in the presence of God are multitudes and multitudes of heavenly creatures of a number of different kinds seraphim cherubim so on and so on right God had had them at his side for who knows how long. The scripture doesn't tell us, but it's implied that it's a very long time. <laughs> None of them could satisfy God's desire for someone like himself to have a relationship with. You know, the Christian ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Why does God desire to gather us back to himself? Because he made us for fellowship with him. The reason he made us like him is because he needed someone like him to be really satisfied in relationship. When you see him coming into the garden looking for Adam and Eve to speak to them, it's a picture of that intimacy of, of relationship. That God shrinks himself down to appear in the Garden of Eden to come and talk face to face with his creation that he's made like himself so he can really relate to it. So it doesn't say it in so many words, but it's, if you like, reading between the lines, it's there. That the reason God knows that none of these other things are going to be a satisfactory help mate is because none of them are like Adam they don't have anything in common 
Just like the angels don't really have much in common with God, even the archangels are, you know, they're lesser beings. They don't share his whole character. So, you know, they're company, but they're not what God was looking for. He made man for that. He made Adam, and he invested his whole being to make him the actual reflection, image of himself, remember? So what does God do? He doesn't take up earth to make another Adam. He takes a bit of Adam to make a subset of Adam. Different than Adam. And this is the bit we need to understand. He took a rib. And from that rib he formed Eve. A woman. Woman just means from man, okay? That's the key of it. Not from the earth, from man. Remember how we said before, in both of those sentences, it went from the description for a perfect, for, for a, from a perfect copy to just the resemblance? Why? Because what just happened? What is the skeleton represent do you know you know a rib's part of your skeleton right god took part of adam's skeleton away and he invested it in making eve adam became less for eve to become anything you know she's entirely from adam for Eve to be, Adam became less. Something was taken away in order for Eve to come into being. Do you get the idea yet? Why those, that 20, verse 26 and 27 are like they are? He, first he starts with Adam, perfect reflection of himself. But to make Eve from Adam... He took something away from Adam. Unlike all the other creations, it's unique about you ladies. God made you not from the earth the way he made everything else. He made you from Adam. The rib, part of the skeleton, what is that? Turn over the page four. So Adam is now missing a bone, right? You think, oh well, maybe it's just a random thing. There's nothing random in scripture, you should know that by now. Is there anybody, any male, because remember the first creation is just male, is there any male who is still 100% the exact image of the father? Oh, I think you've heard of him. What's his name? Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. In the Psalms, Psalm 34, there is a, a, a line that is quoted in the New Testament. When Jesus, remember Jesus has already died so they don't break his legs. And remember, it is they remember then what is written in the scripture about Messiah. Because he's the Lamb of God, it comes from the comes from the rules about eating the Passover lamb. Maybe you're not allowed to break any of its bones. You have to eat it whole, if you remember our Passover series. So I'll read it to you here. Psalm 34, verse 18, we'll start in. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He, this is the Lord, so this is, a, this is a messianic message, okay? So it's a reference to Messiah. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. He keeps all his bones. 
not one of them is broken. Remember Messiah, none of his bones could be broken. His body had to be intact. He dies intact, he's resurrected intact. He is the perfect image of the Father. None of his bones are missing. It's not an accident. When Adam has a bone taken away, he is no longer what in the state that Jesus is. He is no longer the perfect reflection of the Father. What is he now? He's reduced to just resembling him. Remember how we looked at how that verse is, how it starts off all male and perfect reflection, but ends up female and just resembling. It's talking about what ha what's going to happen to Adam. From being the perfect image of God, now he's a bit less. Something's missing. He doesn't reflect all of God anymore. God took part of himself away. And when he made Eve, he made her from the bone that's part of the structure that covers what? What does your ribcage do? Your ribcage covers your heart and your lungs, the breath in you and your heart, the center of your emotions and so on. Adam was the full package. So remember we talked about the breath in him as its origin is God. It's like a copy of God. So this isn't, when Eve is made, it isn't just a rib that's taken. It's what the rib represents in Adam. Where it sits in the body, what it's doing. Think about the I know all men and all women, they're all different, right? There's all kinds of men and all kinds of women. But just think in the most general sense what the fundamental differences are between them in terms of nature and character, generally speaking. Women, on the whole, are more intuitive, they're more compassionate, and they're more nurturing than men. You get exceptions, yes, in both. You get exceptions with men and exceptions with women. But for the most part, that is true. The rib is associated with protecting the heart, compassion, nurturing, the softer, gentler side. But it all began in Adam from God. So what he made Eve out of is that part of himself that he had put in Adam when Adam was the complete picture he took that out of Adam and that became the basis for Eve Adam became less like God no longer a perfect reflection now only resembling him no longer could he completely reflect God anymore because a big and important chunk of God's being and character and nature had now been taken out and was standing there next to him in the form of a woman. Do you see why this is so important? If you think that women were made the same way as men, you might end up thinking that we should be the same. Are we just the same? We just look a bit different? No. It's very, very important to understand the consequences of Eve not being made the same way. And the consequences apply to Adam, first of all and probably most heavily, he can't reflect God anymore on his own. Did you get that? He can't do it on his own. He can only do it if the missing part is there with him. 
Where's the missing part? What's well, Eve? Remember how God said it's not good for them for him to be alone? Well now he made it virtually impossible for him to be to really prosper on his own. Man is even less able to stand on his own now. Because you know that whole nurturing part of God's nature, everything we would call the you know, people talk about the feminine side of God. They usually mean something else. But in, es in essence, everything we associate with femininity, with the female nature as opposed to a, you know, a stereotypical male nature, it's still from God because of what we just looked at. Originally, the whole package was in Adam and God split Adam. I nearly said split atoms, didn't mean to say that. Split Adam and made his whole presence in two packages instead of one. What does that mean about gender? Well, firstly, it's deliberate. And secondly, God deliberately made them different. What's in a man, what dominates in a man, does not dominate in a woman and vice versa. What a man's good at is what a man's good at, but he is no good, for the most part, at what women excel at, by God's design. If you look at what happens when, uh, like, mines in the desert in Aussie or out on oil rigs and things, we just get a whole lot of guys and there's no woman around and they just have to try and look after each other. It doesn't end well. You know, there's always, it always ends up with alcoholics and depression and God knows what. Because, ladies, men are useless at nurturing each other and they are useless at nurturing themselves because God took that out of us and invested it in you. Gender is part of God's design. We'll see more why in a second. The first thing, like I say, to understand is that business of no longer can I as a male fully reflect God because I'm, I cannot as a male ever do a really good job of reflecting what we would now call his feminine side because God took that away from my forebear Adam and put it in my wife. So to fully reflect God it, in a rounded whole way. Remember, Christian means Christ-like. So to fully reflect him well, what do you think you need? It even goes back to the law about witnesses. One witness isn't as good as two. A husband and a wife, or even a male and a female in ministry together, even if they're not married, even if you are a pastor, but you have a female pastor as well in the team, and you and you minister together, much more effective, much, much more effective than a guy on his own or a girl on their own, because neither a woman or a man can any more reflect the whole of God because of what happened. The very foundation of the gender question always comes back to this, that God chose not to make a new, a whole fresh creation like another, like a, like he did making a cow or a camel. He split man into two 
and invested a certain part of his nature in the woman and he left the rest in the man making them what codependent to reflect god to be their best they need each other to a greater or lesser degree they need each other at the very least you will never reach your full potential especially in any kind of ministry but even just as a human being you if you're a guy and you only hang out with guys and you think that you can just go alone you're fooling yourself and it's the same with women we need each other we were designed that way how god created woman confirms it was his design from the beginning now let's have a look we need to say here ah just a quick reminder on the skeleton thing i nearly forgot to answer my own question remember the whole business of none of christ's bones could be broken we've done this before in the passover the skeleton is what holds the body up and allows it to, to move around and carry loads and not fall over and so the body of christ the most important body what is the skeleton that carries out that role in the body of christ it's the word of god the word of god points to the character of god the word of god reveals his very essence what's that very essence that's that breath that he put into adam so the word and the breath are analogous you know they're reflections of each other so taking a bit of the skeleton out and putting it into another person understanding from the skeleton point of view by reducing the skeleton putting part of it somewhere else that confirms if you like the idea that god had reduced adam to no longer be reflect all of himself and he took part of what well, you know part of his revealed nature and moved it into the second thing a woman incidentally you'll get the occasional crackpot that will try and say oh this story isn't true because it says that god took one of adam's ribs away so he should have so men should have one less rib than woman i've heard people have told me this right oh men should have one less rib than woman then if that's true and they don't men and women have 12 sets of ribs whether you're a male or a female unless you have some sort of genetic abnormality and the odd person does but a regular person has 12 sets of ribs right and they say see see so it's a lie because none of the man's ribs are missing what did they forget we have the number of ribs that are left 12 he made a helpmate from us we are the design right so the woman who came second how many ribs did god give her same as what we were left with 12. it's nothing in the scripture nothing in the scripture at all says that we should have one less because when it was taken away there was no woman yet god made it next when he finished making it, he made it with the same number of ribs as we were left with we all have 12 sets of ribs 24 ribs okay so anyway in case someone throws that one at you you can answer anyway let's move on i want to look at this idea of the helpmate a little bit more so if you're on page four we just remind ourselves genesis 2 18 the lord god said it's not good for a man to be alone i'll make him a helper suitable for him so that is fundamental purpose in creating woman right proverbs 18 
He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favour from the Lord. So the Proverbs reinforce this idea that, that the female helpmate, as opposed to lots of your mates, you know, something special about for the male member and it all stems back to the fact that we're no good on our own so get that clear even the proverb says he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor or a blessing from the lord proverbs 19 says this fathers can give their sons an inheritance of houses and wealth so stuff you know so a father can give his sons money and cars and inherit the business and you know all of that houses whatever you can give them all that but then it says but only the lord can give him an understanding wife which is worth more than all those other things put together you know if you're just sitting there with all your toys by yourself you know you'll just be a sorry boy indeed in the end or if you go and try and just grab any old girl going past and marry her you'll be even more sorry only god can give you an understanding wife a helpmate understanding someone remember we said woman being more intuitive that god invested that part of himself in woman more than us intuition understanding compassion all those things god gives you a wife like that if she's like that it's because he put that part of himself in woman as we saw remember the rib covers the heart so we see here a bit of a pattern of god being the one doing the giving that if a man receives such a person a wife or you know a good woman in his life it's god that sent her and in fact that's an important theme so look again with me on bottom of page four now. Remember when he'd finished making the woman, in verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. That order of things is really important. And then Adam replies, this is now bone of my bones flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man then we come on to that next bit verse 24 for this reason what reason the fact that woman comes from man that's for this specific reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh what does that mean it means what we were just talking about because woman came out from us we are deficient without them a man on his own is a bit useless you know he could do a lot of things but ultimately he'd be really limited and certainly very poor at nurturing himself or others because that's the part that we're missing intuition compassion and nurture is where we score low at generally okay like i say there's always exceptions but generally speaking so if you meet guys and they're like that don't get too upset that's how we were made when you get married though you get this opportunity for the missing piece to be rejoined the two parts joined together are like one new creation that reflects the whole the two shall become one flesh what was separated gets joined back together you understand now of course ultimately this is a picture of when jesus comes for his bride so at the at the resurrection at the rapture you go those who are taken up are the bride at the wedding of the lamb so when he receives his bride at the actual wedding in heaven 
when you are presented before God without blemish, without spot, as the bride, you are literally a new creation and you have his nature. Why? Because the two become one flesh, one new creation. That's why in heaven you, you don't have any defects. Because once, remember we're only betrothed, but once a marriage takes place, we take on his nature fully. We become indistinguishable from him in a sense. Like Adam was. We recover that male and female we're talking about because we are all the bride, okay? So we have a female identity in that wedding, if you like, whether you're a boy or a girl. Anyway, over to page five. So this idea that the two coming together, becoming one, has some downsides as well. So let's, on page five, we're going to look at a warning first. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 16. Do not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said the two will become one flesh. For whoever is united with the Lord is one with him. Oh, sorry, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. The basic rule is whatever you unite with, whatever you merge yourself with, you will become like you will become like it. So that was a warning about prostitutes, of course. You know, there's a, oh, I'll come back to that, but remember that rule. Whatever you unite yourself with, whatever you merge yourself with, whether it's sexually or just emotionally or whatever, whatever you merge yourself, you will become like it. Hence, whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So we are meant to be united, but not with just anything at random, Jesus specifically, okay? So the warning side is, this rule works in both directions. The two will become one, you unite, good or bad. Ephesians 5, this is a really important scripture for our topic. This is to do with wives, husbands and wives, okay? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, to set her apart, in other words, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So that's what Jesus wants to do with the body of Christ. He wants to make her clean. He wants her to be one with him so that he can present her as something holy, righteous, spotless, you know, the bride. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. So in other words, we should, husbands, we should be imitating Christ in our desire for our wives to be made holy, righteous and clean, not worldly, but godly. Hence, we, we're supposed to make sure that they are receiving the scripture. You know? He who loves his wife loves himself. Why? Because you're one new flesh. If you don't love your wife, you don't love yourself. Because God has made you one. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That's coming straight from Genesis that we just read. And the two will be one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However... Each one of you guys must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Both of these, the Corinthians 1 and Ephesians, they both draw heavily from Genesis, this principle that we just read about, that the two will come together 
to be like one new thing. Each brings a part of the story. The two parts put together make a whole new story. So anyone just married or contemplating getting married, the first thing you have to understand is that when you're married, who you were is dead. Both of you, male and female. When you marry, a whole new thing emerges that is the combination of who you are and who she is or who, you know talking to the guys i guess remember that it's very important to work on both the husband and the wife to work on allowing god to create that new thing that combined is able to reflect him in a way that you could never when you were separate when you were single Remember, the purpose of marriage isn't just for only for having kids or paying the mortgage or whatever. It's it's a ministry thing. This Ephesians uh, section here is specific about this. It says that marriage is designed by God to reflect on earth the relationship of his son with his bride. So the man should imitate Jesus and the woman should behave as the church ought to behave towards Jesus. Remember, the church is the bride of Christ. So the, the, the woman, the wives, should be reflecting to the earth everything that God hopes the church would be like. While the men should be reflecting to the world Jesus and his concern for his bride. Both roles require significant sacrifice you can't be selfless in this it would never work so both roles require considerable sacrifice considerable obedience and considerable application and you cannot do it unless you're a disciple you need the holy spirit's help but both roles are very different one is not more important than the other it's like adam and eve all of it together reflects him in a way that just the husband or just the wife can never reflect on their own it's only when they come together that that whole picture can be reflected i hope you see that point again why god created gender and assigned different but equal equally important roles to each because all gender is I hope you figured out by now, is himself divided into parts. You got that? When he when he decided to make Eve from Adam instead of making her completely a whole, you know, just from the earth, he was taking what was formerly his his whole self reflected in this pile of dust called Adam and separating it into parts to make Adam and Eve. So all of us are only a part. Even what Paul describes the body of Christ being made up of many parts and each part's role being critical and thus and how we ought to honour the smallest parts most. You know, because even people who think that their part is tiny, what could it matter? Paul says the opposite, no no, the small parts are even more critical. Because without them, the body falls to bits. All of these things throughout Scripture should tell any husband and wife, or if you're t talking to people about Christian marriage, there is no inequality in it, only different roles. The roles are very different for men and women, but the marriage needs them both. If one or other is missing, the marriage is not going to work. Well, certainly it's not going to reach, it's not going to accomplish the purpose for which God created it. So both have to do the role assigned to them and not, you know, you get women who want to be the husband, disaster. Or you get a man who won't be the husband and forces the woman to, you know, disaster. It only works, it's only blessed, it only reaches god's purpose when the man is willing to make the sacrifice to be the husband 
and the woman is willing to make the sacrifice required to be the wife according to God's order for the purpose for which he created it, to reflect himself more fully through it, to make Christ and his people known and seen. So if someone comes to your house and says, wow, you know, whenever I come to your house, it's different. You know, when I'm around you guys, it's different. You know, and I'm happy to say that we have people that say that about Veronica and I, so by some miracle of God we must be doing something, at least partly, right? But that's the basis of it. So I think I've covered ah, one little thing on the Remember how we said that whatever you unite with you'll end up like? The two will become one. And ha and as Corinthians mentioned, that there is the negative side of that. If you unite yourself with something evil, you will end up like it. Okay, so Revelation 18, verse 4. I heard another voice in he from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Her, the her, is Jezebel, the harlot church. We must not be united with Antichrist and his people. We must not be united with rebellion. We must not be united with stubbornness, pride, self-will, all of that stuff. That are the hallmarks of Jezebel, the hallmarks of Antichrist. So even at the end, the Holy Spirit will be screaming at the remnant, come out from her. Do not be united with that. Come out, come out, come out. Because if you stay united with it, you will end up like it. Remember it says, you must come out so that you not, do not share in her plagues and share in her sins. So this basic rule of thumb is pretty it's pretty important. Your eternity can hinge on it. So I guess if God says if you're in a bad church, I don't know what church you're going to if you're listening to this, but if God taps you on the shoulder, opens your eyes and makes you realise that there's something really off, something really wrong, well or people have tried to correct it and the leadership won't listen to the scripture they're too busy listening to their pride or whatever and God says get out when God says get out run don't walk leave at once go and find Jesus wherever he is but don't stay there okay even if you have to leave all your friends even if you have to leave your family even if, if people won't go with you you have to leave them behind you have to get out because if you don't, you will end up like it. You will perish with it. Anyway, let's move on to page six. On page six, some of which I've covered already. So what we'll look at here is uh, the, the idea of God bringing the woman to man. So, of course, you see this reflected directly with Jesus. John 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them. He's the groom. We are the bride. The bride can't come to the groom unless the Father brings them. That's what he's saying. You'll find this throughout the scripture. It's everywhere. Old Testament and New. And it goes all the way back to Genesis. When God made the helpmate for Adam, he brought her to him. He didn't bring Adam to her. He brought her to him. Jesus doesn't change that order. It's the same. Well, is that just an interesting little sideline, or is it something practical? 
well, it's thus. If you are really Christ disciple and you're single, then unless you are going to the kamikaze school for kamikaze pilots, you will not be even considering someone for marriage who's not also a disciple. You'll be unevenly yoked. Your life will end up in a complete terror, an absolute nightmare. The Holy Spirit will be pulling you towards Jesus and your partner will be pulling you towards the world. You'll go crazy. So let's assume that you've got more sense than that and you are waiting for a, a Christian partner. Understanding this means something very simple. If you're a woman or a girl, God is going to tell you first. He won't tell the boy first. If, if it's a God-arranged marriage, the girl will see the guy before the guy sees the girl. God will bring the woman to the man. How will you know? Well, he'll show you himself with that guy for you. That doesn't mean you rush in there and like say, quick, God said we need to be married, bang, done. No. Of course you exercise wisdom and you check it out and all the rest of it first before you even contemplate it. But you should, if you want real confidence that God's in it, understand that you're the one he'll tell first. You're the one he will bring to the guy. And it's also part of the fact that he made you more intuitive. The guys, you know, we're not very intuitive. We will, we are slow on the uptake when it comes to things of the heart. So he brings the woman, the woman is will hear first, right? For the guys, remember that as well. If you think God has said to you, she's the one, go and get her, that won't be God. He doesn't do that. He tells her first. So if you really want the godly woman that God is willing to bless you with, the prop, the real helpmate, or it's a bit of a myth that there's just one woman for every guy. But if you want someone who will, who is able to be the suitable helpmate, if you want someone that God will be with for you and bless, and bless you both and bless the new creation that you'll be together, then you should let him bring her. But what are you going to do in the meantime? Remember, she won't come unless she can see him with you. So you better be a real disciple that all the girls can see Jesus is with. You understand? If you are thinking that you can hang out in the world with your mates in the meantime till God brings it, you're dreaming. Because women are more intuitive, they will see that right away and they will run a mile if they've got any sense. So guys should get on with being disciples. And be open to the fact that at the proper time, a girl might suddenly come into your life and God will knit you together. But that's the way it'll happen. He brings the girl to the woman. The only real exception in scripture is the likes of Hosea, who had the great misfortune of being told by God to take a harlot for a wife, but that's for a specific purpose, so that he would share in God's suffering, because the way Gomer treated um, Hosea was the way Israel was treating God, so it gave Hosea empathy with God to be able to prophesy. Okay, so unless you are a prophet like Hosea, unless God gives you that kind of burden, he will not send you to some woman that, you know, <laughs> has not come to you. So, you know, there is an exception, but it's not the kind of exception you want to volunteer for. You know, absolutely not. Rightio, let's crack on. We keep talking about husbands and wives. 
as if gender was only about husbands and wives. It's very important because lots of you are single. So what's how does it affect you, all this? You know, do you act the same way? What's the story? Does God even acknowledge that you exist? Is he interested in you until you're married? You know, all those sorts of things. People worry about that kind of stuff, I know, because they tell me. But 1 Corinthians 11, bottom of page 6, is going to answer our question. And this is primarily a message for, it applies to everybody, married people as well. But we had enough, we've spoken to the married people a lot. So if you're single, particularly tune in. And I might say if you're a female, particularly tune in. Because what's written here is mostly, well, it's partly what's under assault by Satan in the world. And the world will be counselling you to do the opposite of what this commands you to do as a woman. So listen up, but it's for guys as well, just as, just as much. But I guess we don't feel quite so assaulted about it at the moment. But tune in. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2 I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions I, as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head un, uh, with his head covered dishonors his head. It's going to pause there and explain that because if you can understand the male version, then understanding the female version gets easier. Your head is to do with. Um, he's talking the same way as he talks about the body of Christ. We are the parts of the body, but Jesus is the head. What does the head do in the body? It leads. You know, the hands pick things up, the feet walk the body around, and all the other parts have all these roles. But it's the head that's the command center, isn't it? Your brain is the command center. So in the body of Christ, when Paul's describing the body of Christ, he refers to Jesus as the head of the body, the command center, right? Where it says here that the head of every man is Christ, he's talking about where we look to for authority, where the command comes from. You know, who's in charge? Does that make sense? So for men, we are directly, males I'm talking about, we are directly to be subject to Jesus. Why? Because remember from Ephesians 5, in the marriage we are to reflect him. That burden extends even if you're single. Males, we hold the heaviest burden between males and females because Jesus is revealed to us male. We males carry a heavier burden in regard to reflecting him. So he is our head, our command center. Everything that we do ought to be directed by him, by his example, by his word, and by the Holy Spirit, all of those things working together. It says here, if you pray or prophesy with your head covered, you dishonor your head. Now that sounds like gibberish, right? Let me explain. If you cover, if Jesus is your head and then you cover your head, that is a picture of putting something in a higher place than him. That's all it means. So if you play it Christian, if you pray, if you prophesy, if you preach, if you... You know, proclaim yourself to be born again. But you've got something else sitting in a higher place in terms of 
control and influence in your life than Jesus. You are this person who has his head covered. Everything you do dishonors him because you're not taking your primary instruction from him but from whatever it is you've placed in that higher place. That's what it means by a male making, uh, committing the sin of praying or prophesying with their head covered. And now, people usually say, oh, this is about wearing hats in church. You get, you get even now, you get churches where the men won't wear hats, and the, but they force the woman to wear hats because what of what it says next, that every woman who prays with her head uncovered dishonors the, her head. So if a man covers his head, he dishonors Christ. If a woman prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she dishonors Christ. Confused already? <laughs> Most people will be. We'll just back up and make it simple. So remember the male version? Since Jesus is your head, you can't put anything above him. So that's the idea of covering your head. You can't put anything in a higher place than Jesus in your life or else you're dishonoring him. Now look, it's the female version. You must, the girls must not pray or prophesy with their head uncovered. If they do, they dishonor their head. But who is their head? The head of woman is man, male, because she comes from man. Her connection to Jesus is through, Eve's connection to God is through Adam. God invested himself first in Adam and from that made Eve. Her connection to God is through Adam. This basic arrangement continues throughout the scripture. It's, it's a fundamental in everything that God does and says. What it's saying here is if you are a Christian woman, but you won't submit to the authority God has given his sons, if you want to rule over them, if you want to be the man, you dishonor your head, which is the man, the Christian man in your life, which might include your husband. If you're, a, you know, if you're one of those wives that wants to be the husband, you dishonor your husband. But more importantly, through him you dishonor God. Because you're completely ignoring his order of things. This is the one, one of the ones where, you know, the feminists and that have a field day because they don't understand what this means. So please bear with me before I don't get upset about that. Because we need to understand it in a full before we can really comprehend it. It says here, if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well cut her hair off. Whereas if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. He's using Hebrew cultural icons to make a point that don't necessarily make sense to us now. But even in the 1940s, you know, when the Nazis were defeated, women who had made themselves available to the German soldiers, collaborators, some of them were just taken out and killed as traitors. But the thing that almost invariably happened to them all across Europe was that their own people, so that everyone would know what they were, the shame, they shaved their hair off. They cut their hair off as a sign of shame. So this thing Paul's talking about, although it's just, you know, a cultural picture, it's something that's still with us, even now. And not just in the Hebrew culture, it's everywhere. So the idea of shaving a woman's hair off is a thing of shame still. It's meant to, it's meant to mark you as someone who ought to feel ashamed. 
So that's why Paul's using it to try and get his point across. Back down to verse 10. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. Stop there. What did he just say? Woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. He just repeated the very thing that Genesis explains. Remember, man needs woman. Remember, he needed a helpmate. He's no good without her, according to God. That's why how Eve came about. Paul sounds like some sort of male chauvinist in this, if you read it the wrong way. It's not what he's saying at all. He's trying to get them to understand, just like in Ephesians 5, that what we do on earth ought to be a reflection of God's order in heaven. He's saying the same thing. If you read 1 Corinthians 11 carefully, you'll see that the greatest, the heaviest burden is on the guys. They must not let anything, anything, not their job, their career, their boss, nothing, is allowed to take a higher place in Jesus in their life. Jesus has to be the head. Nothing allowed to be placed higher. Or else they're in big trouble. Right? That's the heaviest weight. The head of the woman is the Christian guys. They are to, they are, to be under God's authority via the men who are under God's authority. The thing that people miss here is that this is a message to the church. It's not a general thing that women have to submit to men. It's in the church, in God's body, as Eve came from Adam, so her relationship with God is through Adam. So it is now. God puts a most accountability to follow, to obey, to be faithful on his sons. Who most directly reflect Jesus because they're male and he's male. Right? So the heaviest burden is on the guys. The women are essential to the guys. We won't make it without you. God made you because we are no good on our own. But as with Eve, your authority comes via us. To be really under the authority of Christ, you need to be safe under the authority of actual godly Christian men, not any old man, and not any old church man either, under those who are themselves under authority, that that authority that they are under, Jesus, is the same authority that you come under by being under those men. Does that make sense? I hope so. You might ask, why? Why can't it just be and remember, this is whether you're ma married or not married. Remember, this is for singles. So for guys, it's easy. Whether you're male or, or sorry, whether you're married or not married, we explained what sort of expected of men. For woman, the issue is who is this guy or guys plural that you need to be in submission to and under the protected. It's about being protected, right? When it says on account of the angels, all angels, including demons. Demons are just angels that have rebelled, remember. So this is about spiritual security. If you're a, a young girl, then primarily, so long as he's saved, that's going to be your dad. And then your brother's. If they're older and if they're born again if the men in your house are not Christian then it's going to be the reliable 
older Christian man in your world that God has put there for you. Might be your pastor, your youth worker, whatever. But again, the qualification is you have to see, be able to see that they are themselves under authority. If they're not, if they're not doing that, if they're not under authority themselves, then they don't count. You don't need to submit to them. Because if they're not in the order of things, you sure don't want to sit under what they're under. Remember? What you join with, you become. So once again, if you think this is Paul just being a male chauvinist, understand that it starts with the heavier responsibility of the males. And the males the woman I submit to are only those who are themselves first doing what the males are supposed to do. Otherwise, the whole thing's a nonsense. So if you're just a young girl still at home, like I say, it's usually your dad if he's also a Christian. But, you know, not everyone has a Christian dad. So it's that person that God has put in your life, or more likely, people. And it's better to have more than one. Now, what if you're, what if you're in your 20s or 30s and you're single, or even in your 40s or whatever and you're single, so you don't, your dad may not be around, or you might live in a different town, or you may so you probably don't live at home anymore, then you're in the same boat as, like I was saying, if someone doesn't have a Christian dad. God will still put godly men in your orbit. It might be, once again, it might be your pastor. It might be, uh, you might have Christian lady friends and it might be their husbands or whatever. The, the key is, I'll come to why it's so important in a second. The key is though, if you're single and you're a woman, take this bit of advice from me. Do not just cling to the pastor. Okay? Because unless God is going to marry you to the pastor, if you just cling like a limpet mind just to, just to the pastor, you won't hear him when he's trying to point some other godly guy that he's trying to bring you to. Plus you might drown the pastor, you might overwhelm him, you know, that happens. But understand, you still need to be under the authority of, what you do as a Christian woman needs to be covered by one who is also under authority by men, plural, ideally. So whether it's your husband or your dad or just the godly men that God puts in your life, the one thing you mustn't do as a woman is fly solo. You mustn't think that you can do without men or go contrary to them because it's contrary to God's order. Which brings me to the why. Remember what we said about God investing that more, what we would now probably call the, his feminine side in woman? And how we can make a kind of generalization understanding there's always exceptions well there is a there is a cold hard reality that God created this rule this order in order to try and protect you as a result of to protect you from and it's this you remember we when we were talking about um, gnosis the kind of knowledge we're supposed to have through applying the theory so we get experiential knowledge of the truth, right? But remember we talked about there was that bad version called Gnosticism, Gnostics, where people, instead of starting, instead of starting with the um, truth, applying it and then gaining experiential knowledge of the truth, they start with just experience and they let feelings and supernatural experiences and dreams and whatever dictate doctrine. Remember that's Gnosticism and how dangerous it is? Because Satan can come in and put on convincing signs and wonders and supernatural experiences and slowly but surely people who, who let 
the experience, let their heart do the thinking, let their emotions do the driving, they get led away from the truth in five, just in five minutes they're gone. The, Satan has them. So Gnosticism is so deadly dangerous. Well, this is part of the issue with the, that fundamental difference between guys and girls. I'm a male. I am never going to be as spiritually sensitive as Christian females. I will never be as intuitive, nor will I be as compassionate, nor able to nurture in the way that born-again godly Christian woman can because of the Adam and Eve thing because that's what God invested in her taking it out of and away from Adam I am missing that because I'm a boy what that does though is it means I'm far less susceptible to be led around by emotion. God made his sons by taking that part out of us. He made us much more black and white. We are much harder to seduce with a light and magic show. We are much harder to seduce with, you know, a vague feeling or, a, you know, uh, particularly just signs and wonders. We are much more able, guys, to take a mathematical kind of approach to Christianity, a more black and white approach. We are harder to convince. We're more difficult for Satan in that regard when it comes to seduction. That's why he often resorts to just, you know, violence against us, spiritual violence. Women, on the other hand, because they are so sensitive are vulnerable and because they're more emotion driven i'm not and please ladies don't get the idea that i'm saying that you're running around like some sort of emotional chickens with their heads off it far from it what i'm saying is compared between the two you have a higher vulnerability because you are more sensitive because you are more heart centered than we are more head centered and remember we need you because you're like that, because it's missing from us. We are complementary, remember. Therefore, God has to have a way of protecting you from Satan getting at you through that vulnerability. Which is why when you have a feeling or a dream or, you know, something more intuitive like that the first person you need to tell and talk about it and go to the word about it with is that christian male who is your head's covering whether it's your husband your dad your pastor or whatever whoever it is or preferably more than one because often it's real and the guys missed it because we're not that sensitive. We're often the last to catch on as a result. You know, woman picked up something's going on much sooner than guys do. It's that complementary ministry thing. But if you won't submit to the fact that God has put this different ability in the guys that ability to be more black and white, more, I nearly said discerning, in a sense discerning, but we are more able to just hang the plumb line of the word and just in a black and white way say, that's from God, or no, that's not from God, it can't be, and and explain why, you know, in a loving way to help someone say, oh, okay, so that's the enemy trying to play games with me, and you so you're safe. This is what this is about. This is why God requires it. Because in giving you the gift of that extra sensitivity, that extra intuition, that extra nurturing, softer nature, 
the downside is there's a certain vulnerability comes with it. So by keeping yourself under the wing, if you like, or under the shield of your your dad, your husband, your brother or brothers in Christ or whoever it is that are the, are those those obedient godly men in your life as a woman this is how God shields you from being you know injured or deceived or taken you know taken away because of that vulnerability and the guys we need you to talk to us we need you to come to us because Otherwise, we often don't see things happening until too late because we lack that very sensibility that you have. It is a collaborative, cooperative thing. We need both for the body to be well. We need both for the whole of God to be represented. Does that make sense? So this is nothing at all to do with male dominance or anything like that. Because remember, the only males you really need to submit to are those who are themselves in submission to God. Everything in his order. Why did I include that? Well, you, you need to know that anyway, especially at a time like, you know, we're living in. But it's another example of how that foundational, the way God created gender, the fact that he made it, dividing himself so that the whole of him is in two parts so that the two parts need to always come together to be well this is just another expression of that and I hope by that you can get how understanding the foundation helps you see more clearly God's purpose in it and that it's not weird and it most particularly it's not Paul just being some sort of male chauvinist you know dog trying to suppress all the women under his thumb. Far from it, anything but. Primarily, Paul is trying to protect the woman and the church from things that were going on. What else do we need to know here? God just reminded me of something. It's to do with what we're just saying. You get people who blame Eve for the fall. You know, I've met some crusty old guys and they say, ah, oh, woman, you know, woman. Oh, it's their fault, you know, what happened in the garden. You know, stupid woman ate the apple. You know, and, and you're thinking, <laughs> you idiot, <laughs> read the scripture. Eve is the one that Satan went for. Why? Exactly what I just said. The fact that she's primarily the sensitive emotion based one of the two of the partnership means she is more easily seduced, more vulnerable to emotional manipulation. What did the serpent do? Did he bully her? No. He played with her feelings, he played with her emotions, he played with her, you know, he played with her, he sucked her in, right? So he attacked her vulnerability. The fall could have been averted, right? Because she goes to Adam and she wants him to eat of it as well. Adam knows what God said. Remember the, the boys were the black and white ones? Adam knows what God said. Don't eat of that tree. Black and white, that's the rule. He said no. No is a complete sentence. What does Adam do? He goes, oh, yes dear. Anything to please you. <laughs> and the four resulted. The fall isn't Eve's fault, the fall is Adam's fault. Adam vacated the authority that Eve was supposed to be subject to. Satan won that round of the game 
because Adam vacated his authority to please his wife. It's exactly what King Ahab did with Jezebel. Instead of saying to his evil wife, I'm the, God, I'm the king of Israel and the God of Israel says no and therefore I say no, you know, back in your box. He gives up his authority that God gave him to please his wife. And look what happened to Israel as a result. The fall is really Adam's fault. But the attack came on Eve because Satan knew he it would never work on Adam. You get that? So this is exactly what we were just talking about. Eve will, Eve's safety depended on Adam exercising the authority God had given him in Eve's life. And he didn't do it. He wimped out and gave her, you know, he just wanted to please her and forgot that that isn't, you know, because your wife is made differently. What seems right to her isn't always right. The only thing that works out is when the two parts work together. The sensitive part and the black and white part have to both have their input. Remember the whole of God applied, not just the parts. Hence, ladies, don't be like Eve. Understand you're a vulnerable. Make sure you have godly men in your life. And before you act on emotion or on anything supernatural or a dream or anything like that at all, go and talk about it and examine the scripture about it with one or more of those guys. Because if it's really a guy who's in proper submission to God, he will listen and he'll be concerned to go and examine that against the scripture and give you authoritative advice from the word and by the spirit that will either confirm it and then you can act together about it or show you how it can't be from God and how it's the enemy coming to, you know, the serpent in the garden coming to play games with your head and therefore deliver you out from it. Either way, you need to go and make use of what God invested in him just like he needs that nurturing and encouragement and intuition that God invested in you as a female. Guys need girls and girls need guys. It's a mutual, a mutual need. It's a collaborative venture or it's no venture at all. Anyway, almost done now. So I'm going to take my life in my hands and we're going to look at what is usually the, the scripture where uh, feminists and politically correct people and those who love to assault the scripture and especially to assault the character of the likes of Paul as just a bunch of male misogynist woman hating, you know, arrogant so-and-sos. And therefore, they want to come along and chop big chunks out of the Bible. And in fact, lots of churches basically do that because they're full of them. And it's 1 Timothy 2. And it's to do with women teaching in the church and things like that. It confuses the daylights out of a lot of people. I know a lot of people who felt really hurt really confused I know a lot of women in ministry who've given up because someone's come and used this like a battering ram and beaten them half to death with it so it's really really important that we understand what it actually says but the only way you can really understand what it actually means is if we take this New Testament scripture and we sit it on that foundation that we now hopefully understand of the gender division being nothing more than God dividing the whole of himself into two parts and causing both parts to have equal need for each other. 
for God to be reflected, the two parts have to act as a team together. One is not greater than the other. One is not more important than the other. It is a codependency. They are both dependent on each other, right? Equal value, very different roles. When we can when we understand that foundation, then difficult scriptures like this aren't so difficult to understand. So here we go. If you've got your Bible, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. Paul says, I want men, males, everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So what does he want the men to do? He doesn't want them wasting their time in arguments and disputes. He wants them focused on God, lifting up holy hands. Holy meaning set apart. He doesn't want them to be worldly. He wants them to be set apart to Christ. So in a few short words, he's put a massive burden on the men, a burden that, they, that God himself puts on the men. You are to reflect Christ. You are not to waste your time with earthly arguments. We will be caught up in pointless disputes. We are to be set apart to Christ as his witnesses, and the heaviest burden of that is on us guys, because we're descended from Adam. We are male, as Jesus was male. We are, have a heavier burden in carrying his image to the world than our helpmate does. The greater weight falls on us. And Paul just covers that in a few short words. But now we turn to the one that usually sends people bouncing off the ceiling. The woman. Paul says, I also want the woman to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Actually, that's not that controversial. But I have been in places where women get up in arms about it. Because he think, they think that Paul's instructing them that they must dress, you know, like a bunch of fuddy-duddies or something, that they're not allowed to, you know, have a nice appearance or anything like that. It's not what he's saying. He's saying to them, you mustn't be like the woman of the world. You're meant to be Christ's disciples. You're meant to be the helpmate of these men who are meant to be holy. Therefore, don't do what the worldly women do. Don't dress the kill. Don't, don't focus on outward appearance. That's the primary thing. Don't focus on outward appearance. Don't wear a camouflage of jewels and makeup to keep who you are inside hidden because that's really what cosmetics is for. He says, but you ought to be seen as you really are, servants of Christ, by your good works, your kind heart, and so on. That's all Paul's saying. You, like the men, you are to be holy, set apart from the world. So up to there, it's not so bad. But, you know, if you want to wear a nice, you know, nice clothes, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't be like the world. That's all he's saying. And certainly don't dress to seduce. Guess I'm saying that to the young out of my own experience in a number of youth groups. That some of the girls in the youth group were, were dressed like, you know, well, you wouldn't hardly believe. Basically, they've got their sights set on seducing the guys and the, the young guys. This is not the behaviour of a Christian woman. It's what Paul's saying. If you profess to be a Christian woman, you need to act with a certain amount of dignity and propriety, separate and unlike those who are unsaved and of the world. Anyway, let's get past that, because the part we really want to get to is verse 11 and verse 12 which is the one that causes the most trouble for people. Here we go. Verse 11. A woman 
should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But woman will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. So what happens is in English, remember this is in English, it sounds like Paul was saying it's Eve's fault for the fall. Remember what we were just saying about that? And therefore, he wants woman to just sit still and shut up and don't say anything, you know, just sit there in quietness, remain quiet, you're not allowed to teach, you're not allowed to assume any authority, and your place is in the home having kids, you'll be saved through childbearing, you know. That's just, now I'm speaking like a typical feminist critic and to be fair read in English it sounds like that's what he's saying or or to be fair it's hard to argue that he's not saying that if you read it in English but of course it's not written in English it's written in Greek Let's look at it more closely to see what he's really saying. So let's start with it, because we just mentioned it. Let's look at verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. He's just stating fact, but he's stating the fact the way I did. What he's actually doing, he's not belittling Eve. He's just pointing out a reality. That because she's a woman... She is the one that Satan attacked because the form of attack was through emotional manipulation, you know, like the Gnostic thing. He isn't belittling Eve, he's just pointing out that the fall came about because Satan attacked her vulnerability because she doesn't have that part of God primarily that men do just as men don't have the part of God that women prior, primarily do. But it sounds terrible <laughs> that when you read it in English, but it's not what he's, he's not putting her down, he's just stating a fact the same way as I did a second ago. I, I went there first so that you can understand that when he says a woman should learn in quietness and full submission, you have to understand that Paul was saying that a woman should learn. It's the first thing he says, a woman should learn. He's not in any way suggesting at all that, that a female does not have an active and full place and need, therefore, to understand the scripture and be able to share it. Paul, everywhere else in the scripture, encourages women who are hosting churches in their homes, they have pastoral roles. A number of prophetesses, Paul quotes them. Paul doesn't have a problem with women in ministry. You get churches that say women are not allowed to be in ministry, it's just nonsense. Paul doesn't say that at all. So what does he say? We have to look very closely what he actually says, not what people presume he's saying. So the first thing to notice is the woman should learn, but she should learn in quietness and full submission. Full submission to who? Well, it's what we just learned. Full submission to the authority of the scripture through those godly men that God has put in her life as a head covering. So because she's a female and more prone, I'm not saying like a pushover, but there is a higher degree of risk if she doesn't check it out, check out her understanding with the guys. Does that make sense? So that's all Paul's saying. She needs to learn in submission. She shouldn't just think, oh, well, I think I know what that means, and roar off with the other girls and not check it. 
it's contrary to what God has, has said to do, and it's dangerous. That's why he ref, that's why he raises the Eve issue. Because just as Eve was able to be deceived, because that's her weak spot, so it is with all Christian women. It's the point of vulnerability that men are supposed to cover as a shield for them. But to be covered, you've got to stay underneath that shield, ladies. So he's saying, study. You must study. You should do it in quietness and full submission, full submission primarily to God, but in that way we've just described. Making use of the godly men that God has put in your life so that you can be confident. This isn't about keeping you like a little mouse. This is about so that you could be confident that what you have studied, that your understanding is right. So your sub the end result of your submission should be confidence. That sounds contradictory, it's not. Then he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. He doesn't mean that he doesn't permit women to teach. How do I know that? Because elsewhere in the scripture, he specifically tells women to teach children and each other. So he's not double-minded. So he cannot mean he doesn't permit women to teach when he specifically tells them to teach elsewhere. You have to read this in its context. He's saying he doesn't permit women to teach or assume authority, these are two aspects of one thing, over a man. The key word there is over. Remember what we were just saying about the head of the woman is man and the head of man is Christ? That's the order of the authority. This is still going on about that vulnerability, the fundamental difference between the genders. The strength God put in one is not in the other, and vice versa. So what Paul is saying is, not that women can't teach, but they can't be the arbiters of doctrine. They can't be, they can't take a higher authority than the men. They mustn't at any time override the men of the the godly men of the church, particularly in matters of doctrine. I'm just trying to make sure that people understand. This. Um, right. It'll get clearer still. It, it ends with, so a woman is not allowed to teach a man in the sense of telling him what's right and what's wrong and expecting that he has to submit to it. That's that's what he's saying. She mustn't presume to take authority over a man. That's authority God does not give her. God's order puts that authority first with his sons, right? It's God's rule, not mine. Then the bit that drives feminists crazy, it says she must be quiet this is verse 12 she must be quiet and this is what has people thinking including stupid men in churches that can't study who actually think that paul is instructing a woman in the church to sit there with her hands in their laps and make no noise like a church mouse right well again if the problem is english that word it's he, uh, I'm going to remind myself, but oh, it is that. It's um, Heisukia. Heisukia. Translated as quiet, right? Let me read you the actual definition from Strong's. Quietness implying calm for the believer. The use of their God produced calm, which includes an inner tranquility that supports appropriate action. The term does not mean silence. You get that? 
there's a whole different word, sege, so I think that's a Tagalog word, isn't it, as well, is it? but in Greek, sege is the word for silent as in the absence of noise. If Paul meant the woman should sit there making no noise, he would have said sege. He didn't. He said hesukia. So, if those of you who watch Star Trek, you know Mr. Spock? Mr. Spock is an example of hesukia. He sits there, he thinks it through, he reasons, he doesn't have a lot to say, but then when he does have something to say, it's just a few words, but it's all about action, having thought it all through, an inner, an inner quietness, you know? It's, Hesukia is a reflection of strength, not weakness. Hesukia implies that the woman doesn't need to make a lot of noise to make her point. That she can sit there and listen and consider and pray, then check it with her head covering, and then act without the need to make a fuss, because she's strong, not weak. You understand? Has nothing to do with silence. Has nothing to do with sitting there like a spectator. At all. So what has Paul actually said then? Women should learn. But when they learn, they need to do it in submission to the authority God established for their protection. So that they don't end up falling into the trap Eve fell into. God put the godly man in their lives as a head covering, as a shield to them, not as a slave master, but as a shield. Because the only men she should submit to are those who are themselves in submission to God. Who will, like the husbands in Ephesians 5, be willing to lay their lives down to protect them. So that authority is used for the woman's protection, not for her harm. And she's to sit there in stillness, quiet, but not the quiet that comes from being too scared to speak, the quietness that comes from being mature, considerate, reflective, strong inside, not needing to make a big noise, jump up and down or a fuss. Does that make sense? I sure hope it does. What else do I need to add here? Once again, it's Paul recognising the difference between the genders. He's not belittling the woman. He's requiring the woman to act in their role that God assigned them because the men need them to be that. And the woman, guys, need you to be what he ordained for men to do. Remember, both roles are just as important as the other, but they are different. I think I might have covered most of page nine already, have I? Ah, just one last thing. And that's verse 15 of that where it ends with what sounds silly and really condescending, but isn't. He says, Women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So read in English and read on the assumption that, male is some, uh, that Paul is some sort of male chauvinist pig. It sounds like He's belittling in women and saying, you don't have any role in ministry, you don't have any role, really, you're just, you know, you're just here to have babies. That's what it sounds like. Go home and have babies and that will be your salvation. And I've heard guys say that, you know, you want to slap them, but God doesn't let you. So <laughs> what does it really mean? What's he really telling them? This is a bit of a midrash thing. The first part of the sentence is, ec is then echoed in the second part of the sentence. The woman will be saved through childbearing 
bringing children into the world and raising them. Elsewhere, Paul specifically tells the woman that the the burden for the first and most of when is, let me get something really clear. Think about yourself. You learn most and you learn fastest and you learn the things that never leave you primarily when you're a child. The older you get, the harder it is to learn new things. The foundations that are put in when, you, uh, when you're a child last the longest through your life and have the most influence. That's why your childhood tends to dictate the outcome of your life to a large degree unless God really intervenes supernaturally. That's why so many people are in counselling because of what happened to them when they were kids. The effect on you in your childhood is profound and it lasts. So of all the teaching roles in the church, which do you think is the most important? Teaching the adults or teaching the children? It's teaching the children. As we did in our Passover series, the whole Passover meal, everything, is to teach the children. God thinks teaching the children is the most important. Why? Because if you don't lay the foundations early and you don't lay them right, and if you don't set them up for success as children, it's remarkably more difficult to put them right later when they're adults. If they set up properly, then all they need is maintain and to keep growing as adults. Who does God give the task of teaching the children? Woman. Woman. The primary task, Paul himself makes it clear to them, that their primary role as teachers of the gospel is to teach each other, in other words, to encourage each other, and to teach the kids. It sounds condescending, but actually he is acknowledging that the most important teaching job in the church is assigned to them. Why? Because they can learn the, what to teach and they can check it with their head covering. They can check the facts with their husbands or their fathers or their or pastor or whatever. The guys are there to help them with that. But what they can do that the guys can't do is nurture. And kids need nurturing. Kids need encouraging. Kids need intuition, they need sympathy, they need all those things that guys are not particularly good at providing. So when the human being needs careful teaching and careful nurturing the most is when that's young and a child. Who is best equipped for that? Woman. Who does God have them teach? Uh, who, who does God send to teach them? The ladies. So actually God gives the most, you know, probably the most important teaching role in the church to the girls. All Paul says is you can't come and teach the adult males. They are your heads covering. You must be in submission to them. That's their role. The men will teach the men and the adults. But the foundations he leaves for the woman to teach and to instill because how he made woman makes them basically skilled at that in a way that most males just can't even begin to imagine. So being saved through childbearing doesn't just mean sitting at home popping out kids. Childbearing has a two sides to the meaning not only actually having actual human babies, but spiritual babies. Every human being was born, but not every human being is born again. If you are involved in teaching or in giving the gospel or in instruction by word or by example to the young as a woman, you are helping spiritual babies be born. You are bringing born again souls to life by that by giving them the truth you are bearing children at home with your husband in a physical sense 
in the ministry through your your work and example in the spiritual sense it's both things at once that you as a woman are better at than us even people who are who might be 50 years old but they're a spiritual baby in terms of Christ they need a woman's touch when they get it wrong you know if they could if they've only got the gruff old pastor to go to you know they'll they'll go to him for the black and white but when they mess up when they don't understand I feel like crying giving up if there's not a good Christian woman there to provide nurture and compassion and understanding and intuition that their pastor or the elders you know the guys haven't got then that person will get really injured and probably leave and might die spiritually childbearing actual and spiritual and then it just echoes if they have if they continue in faith maybe that word is pistis so that's belief and action that consistent with the belief love holiness with propriety propriety means like maturity and being conscious of God you know with with humbleness and sincerity so this is not demeaning at all not by any means Paul is simply recognizing that God has given different roles to the two genders and there's only two genders by the way I guess I'm saying that especially for the ladies to protect you from those people who try and rob you of that sacred place that's a privileged place that's a ministry men can't do well when they try and do it they usually really clumsy and mess it up because we're not good at it why because you've got that part of God that Adam had but was taken away and put in you and we boys don't have that but we have the part of God you don't have I need you you need me it only works when the two come together and act as one whether it's in a marriage as one new flesh whether it is, is in a Christian congregation or in a Christian fellowship or amongst Christian friends where the guys and the girls do their part in a equally codependent mutually acting partnership each bringing that part that the other side is missing bringing it together so that the whole of God can be presented wherever you look in the scripture even difficult passages like this when you can apply that fundamental foundation separate roles equally vital and equally essential to the other guy the guys are no good without the girls the girls are no good without the guys God made them equal in their dependency on the other but the role very different he gave them specialized roles by putting a particular part of himself in one and not in the other if you can understand that very basic thing from Genesis then even these really tricky to understand and even more tricky to explain scriptures like first Timothy are easy easy to understand in the end so we're going to end there you're probably thinking God will he ever end but there's the end of it please read through the notes please think and pray about these things and most particularly no matter how hard the world tries to get you to change God's order of things if you're a woman be glad God made you a woman and embrace the woman's role because the men will collapse if you don't and if you're a guy be glad that you God made you a guy and embrace the male's responsibility because the woman are not safe if you don't whether it's in a marriage in a church or just in life in general so with that in mind father we ask you 
to really instill these things in us, write them in our hearts and minds, wash away any prejudice that the world or politics or university or anything else has poisoned our minds with, Lord, so that we can see these things as you established them for our good, because you made them for our good and for our protection to help us protect each other, to make us mutually, Lord, mutually in need of each other, men and women. We pray, Lord, if there's anyone out there who doesn't have anyone who can, whether it's as a husband, a wife, or just a close friend, or pastor, or mentor, or parent, or anything, Lord, if there's anyone out there that is missing the other half and just can't find it, we pray, Lord, that you'd lead them to that person or lead other people to them. That you, you Lord, you said you, you bring the lonely into family. You, Lord, bring the lonely into family. So those, Lord, who, who can't do, who can't benefit from what we've just been talking about because they're on their own, we put it to you, Lord, and burden you, Lord, for their sake with the task of bringing them into your order of things where they can be safe and where they can bring the precious thing that you invested in them, male and female alike. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. God bless. Thanks for your patience. I know it's a tricky subject, but I hope that you gain something from it. So until next time, uh, which may be next week, there's a possibility it'll be in two weeks' time, uh, depending on some whether we something that the family might be doing, but we'll let you know during the week. Otherwise, that's it from me. God bless and Shalom.